questions you have yeah yeah with this i have as we discussed rational map will be given by some open sets it can even be just one no if they are if they are if the description is given by a many open sets then they should be uh, the you have you have to use the equivalence relation so intuitively i think this is because open set essentially is everything so the closure of that will be the whole of x yeah the definition is very relaxed but if you make it dominant then you see that on the lhs u is almost everything and on the rhs image of u is also everything so probably the correct thing is dominant rational map which we usually think of no why that is not no no that definition was just saying uh, have an inverse so x and y are called bi rationally equivalent or maybe we can also say just bi rational if uh, there is a phi and there is a phi inverse i mean which can be further described so which what it means is that uh so what should you do so you apply phi on x you get to y and then you apply phi inverse so this should be identity and uh, the opposite yeah yeah our identity maps or maybe i should call morphism right oh i need the space so that should yeah so for this you only uh, need definition on open patches not the whole of x yeah so phi inverse is not really uh, what we usually think it is it's some other map psi but phi composed with psi or psi composed with phi behaves as a as the morphism Uh, identity on certain patches okay i think we should then start and uh, so in this it was correct that x and y i by are i mean the where i the curve y is bi rational to the affine line that is correct because of the field uh, being isomorphic the function fields being isomorphic but do you know what is the what is the morphism at the level of the point which you have so what is this map phi so point on x will just be a single coordinate on on y there it will be two coordinates how do you expand this uh, this 1 to 2 so you can actually get it from the field isomorphism so this uh, kx function field is isomorphic to this uh, let's say parameter y small ky and this big ky function field is isomorphic to the same uh, 
uh, function field small k y, but at the level of x 1 uh, there is a square root happening right. So, actually I will just give you the point level map it will be point y square here is mapped to y square y cube. Okay, so, note that y square comma y cube is always a point on the curve y, the big y because x 1 cube is equal to x 2 square right. And uh, in the affine line saying that we are going over the points y square is basically going over all the points because every point is a square small k is an algebraically closed field right. So, this bi-rational map is essentially giving you parameterization of the curve y. Okay, so, you, you can actually deduce point level map from the function field isomorphism this is it. Uh, then we had affine open we are calling this x sub f affine open which is uh, which we showed we actually showed a bi-rational isomorphism or equivalence between uh, the affine open and this 0 set the hyper surface. Okay, so, so x f is actually it is it's this distinguished open set, but it is also bi-rational to a in fact, it is also an isomorphism. So, the you have morphism both ways. So, it is isomorphic to a hypersurface in a bigger uh, ambient space affine n plus 1 space. Motivation for rational map is uh, oh, so basically we want uh, something that we can compute and working with the function field is easier to compute. So, we I mean as we saw here the coordinate ring uh, testing for this isomorphism is a bit harder, but when you are in the function field then you can actually identify you can do this uh, the thing we did in the end which is you basically break up your function field into the purely transcendental part and the algebraic part which will be finite. And uh, then studying your variety and comparing your variety with other varieties reduces to just this finite part. Okay, so, you actually have and which helped here by showing which shows actually that uh, you have uh, by rational equivalence to any hypersurface. So, these are things you could not do with morphism, but you can do it with rational map. So, the rational map the point is that for a variety we just simply looking at this function field. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. We So, working with I mean you want to reduce the theory of varieties to the theory of fields. So, think of it as a reduction. Yeah, and I think uh, it was a good suggestion that I should not use isomorphism, but just call it by rational equivalence. So, it this I will just say is by rational to a hypersurface. Oh, since you came late, so I gave here the point by point map between the affine line and the curve. So, it is basically this parameterization. So, y square is being mapped to phi square comma phi cube. This is the by rational equivalence between line and the curve. It comes from the function field isomorphism written carefully. No, no, we do not well, I am mapping points of x to points of y in the in that way. So, any point in x can be thought of as y square. Yeah, so sure, but everything will work. 
it's still a bi birational map. Yeah, so you can think about both. You can think about the map happening in the affine n space, or you can think about the map happening in the function field. That, but that translation takes some effort. So you have to do it carefully. Uh, yeah, any questions till now? Then we'll start uh, studying smooth points, so non-singular varieties. So what is uh, singularity or and the opposite of it is smoothness. When will you call a point P on a variety X to be smooth or non-singular? So yeah, so the picture that you should remember uh, in this topic is the following. So you have the X, Y axis. And uh, you have some curve, so you can uh, identify. I mean, you can pick a point P, and what you are interested in is uh, the tangent at this. And the way to define tangent, at least in real analysis, is you try out several points that gives you a chord. and uh, keep moving closer to P and in the limit you will have the chord which is path which intersects with the variety or in this case the curve only at this point P right that which is called the tangent. That is true. Yeah, it can. It can. Yeah, the curve can come back, and the tangent can again intersect it. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, but I mean, we have a notion of distance in analysis. So, so in the neighborhood of P, you only see a single intersection, which is P. I don't want to go into multiplicity because I mean it's very difficult to define any of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So local is the first thing you will try because you have a some idea of metric. So in the neighborhood of P, the tangent should in intersect the curve at exactly one place, which is this point that you are interested in. Yeah, so this is the variety X and point P and uh, that is called the tangent. So tangent in is a line here and in general it will be a, a hyperplane, right. In 3D it will be a plane and so on, one dimension less. So that is the thing which you want to generalize without drawing any pictures and without having this metric of distance. So how do you do that? So let x be uh, a fine variety. Let i x be the ideal defining it. So it is the ideal in A which is uh, the coordinate ring of the affine variety. And pick a point uh, in X. So uh, yeah, so with this intuition of line what you want is actually a vector space, right. You should define your instead of defining tangent now what you should define is a tangent space. 
So, it will be a vector space and for that what you should do is uh, you should look at only the linear parts of these generators f i s. So, so the idea is that you want to reduce the non-linear structure of x at p to a linear vector space. So, it becomes a k vector space So, we define the, the tangent space uh, as the linear space over the field ba uh, base field small k. Uh, for simplicity, I will assume here, which is without loss of generality, that p is the 0 point. P is the origin. In that case, uh, the definition is the following of the tangent space. So, tangent space I will we'll write it as T sub x comma P and it will simply be the zero zeros of ideal linear part okay so this ix1 is the linear part of the ideal which i define further as f i s linear part and uh, yeah I do not need see so, the, so actually the ideal generated by these linear forms. Now, you should remember here that uh, f i 0 is 0. So, f i at p is f i at 0 which is equal to 0. Why is that? Well, because we are assuming that uh, the point p is 0, I mean coordinates are all 0 and it's, it has to satisfy each of these f i s which means that f i at 0 is 0 which in other words f i is constant free right. So, f i starts with a linear form then there is a quadratic form then there is a cubic form and so on to arbitrary degree up to degree of this polynomial f i. So, we are only looking at the linear form part that is being called f i 1 and the common zeros of these f i 1s is or the, the ideal generated by f i 1s is called i x 1 and the common zeros is the tangent space t x p. Is that clear? Why is it different like this? Uh, why? Well, because it will match the picture. Exactly. So, you can't define partial derivatives for polynomials. Yeah, yeah. So we'll come to that. So that's the. So this is the tangent space. Let's check the properties later, and. Uh, so, tangent space is uh, yeah what should so how does it compare with x see x was the zeros of uh, f common zeros of f 1 to f t the tangent space is common zeros of the linear parts of them. Uh, so, what has happened is uh, locally uh, you can potentially see a bigger space you will get more points you will get clearly you will get points uh, which are outside of x the variety x right. 
So, in the picture also that it is happening that the point P you are getting on the tangent line, but all the other points are outside the curve, right. So, a similar thing is happening here also. Uh, so, instead of drawing this T x P, we just define it as the like as a different variety, but it happens to be a vector space. Right, you can see that two points in TXP can be added. It's again a root, coordinate wise. Oh, then it is zero. Then IX one is will be zero. Sure. No, no, no. It's no, no. We are not expecting anything. This is the definition. It is fixed now. The only thing we have done is we have picked. P to be the 0 point. So, your only valid question can be what happens for other points. So, for other points we will actually shift the whole system f 1 to f t by that point. So, that 0 is a root ok. So, for any other point uh, you just shift the system. So, the whole variety will basically be shifted by the point P. So, that you come to the origin. Right. So, so any other variety, any other point on a given variety you can work like that. Uh, yeah, but the definition for 0 is this, there is no other option. It is a unique definition as we will see. It will satisfy everything we want. So, what is the tangent space of uh, y square minus x? Yeah, yeah, we will see an example, but let me first talk about the coordinate ring of this. Uh, it is called the dual space. So, the linear functions on the tangent space gives us the dual space which I will denote as T x p wedge and this is as stated a 1 mod i x 1 ok. So, A 1 is basically the linear forms in the polynomial ring modulo the ones which you are considering 0 which is i x 1. So, these are the linear functions which are defined on the tangent space. So, this is the dual of the tangent space. It is slightly different from the coordinate ring of tangent space, but it is something more uh, familiar as it is the dual of a vector space. Uh, ok, so yeah, so an example has to be given because there are many questions. So, let us see the example of affine line. So, in this case and the point we are taking is the 0 point. So, there is only one coordinate it is 0. So, what do you think is T x p? What is the tangent space of the affine line at the origin? So, this will be 0 of i x 1. And as Madhavan said, I x uh, for I mean in this case, I x was itself actually 0. So, I x 1 is again 0. So, this is zeros of 0, which is everything, the affine line itself, right. So, yeah, so it is not, I mean, geometrically it makes sense for the affine line tangent at the origin is the whole line right. It is consistent with our geometric picture. This is good. Uh, what is the dual of that? So, dual is mod i x 1 which is 0. So, it is a 1 which happens to be just k times x 1. Right, or the vector space spanned by x 1 
over the base field k. Right. So, in this case you can, you can also look at the dimension. So, what is the dimension of the tangent space? So, that is for the affine line 1. What is the rank of the tangent space as a vector space over the base field k? That is also 1. And uh, what is the dimension of the dual? That is also 1. Or maybe I should say rank. Okay, so, the tangent space dimension and that of the dual both of them is 1. You can talk about dimension or the vector space rank. Uh, yeah, so, we did not see partial derivatives here. We will do that next. But any questions till now? I hope this is fine. The affine line example sets the stage for everything else. You can do the same thing in other examples. In particular, this example you were asking y square equal to x cube also. We will we'll do that I think later. Let us first uh, go to the relationship with partial derivatives. Yeah, I want the dimension of the variety. Yeah, because I define T x p to be the 0 set. Yeah, you prove all those things. See, you have this is the sim, this is the best case possible, right? You have linear system, and you are looking at the zero set. I mean, it has to be an affine variety. So um, we can prove this. We should prove this proposition now to see the effect of derivatives. So uh, the rank of this tangent space and the rank of the derivative matrix. So, do j f i right you have f 1 to f t and you have variables uh, x 1 to x n. So, you look at this uh, this matrix of first order derivatives partial derivatives because f i is n variate. So, this is also called the Jacobian matrix of the polynomial system. Uh, what is the meaning of rank of this matrix? So, you are looking at the rank over the function field, right? It is a functional matrix. So, you look at the rank over the polynomial ring or the function field. Yeah, but I do not want that. So, I so I want local information around P. So, actually, I should be evaluating this at P. So, the matrix at P, look at the rank of that. Uh, so, that so this rank plus the tangent space rank should be what? What do you think? For example, in this affine line case, what happened? So, rank of the tangent space came out to be 1 and rank of this matrix is 0. Derivatives were all 0, right? So, the sum was 1, which happens to be the dimension of x. Uh, well, it also happens to be n, so in general it will be n. That is what we want to show. Then that rank of the Jacobian, it is over k, right? Or the function that we evaluate? Yeah, I know I, I spoke too fast. So, we will actually look at the matrix at the point p, then it will become, it will become small k. Yeah. Yes, uh, you do not want to look at the functional matrix because you are only interested uh, in the variety up to the point p around p. So, you should actually evaluate it, but the matrix name is correct. So, if you just look at the functional matrix, it is called the Jacobian of the system. which was what f 1 to f t. So, yeah. So, look at the Jacobian of the generators 
of course i mean the weird thing here is that the generators are not inherent to the affine variety so you can pick some other generating set also jacobian will change but still this theorem will remain true it doesn't depend on generators it's something it's an inherent property of of the geometry not of the representation uh, how do you prove this so now you do the school calculation the way you calculate uh, tangents right so we you have to do this in higher dimension now so the linear space txp is given by the system of equations so differentiate the i mean okay uh, what was it there in the definition it was uh, these fi ones so what is fi1 f i 1 happens to be this let us check this is this correct. So, the difference is that in the LHS I have only linear part of f i, but in the RHS I am using uh, derivative jth derivative on I mean it is basically you are differentiating by x j. So, do by do x j you are applying that on uh, f i the full f i it has also quadratic term and so on. But these quadratic terms when you differentiate you still get a variable there and at p which is 0 that contribution is 0 right. So, so you can see that this is a it is an identity and uh, that as you go over all the i's that is your system defining t x p. Uh, so, t x p is essentially the solutions x j of this system which gives you the claim the proposition. So, it is solution space x bar in k to the n. is of uh, linear rank equal to n minus. So, these are n variables uh, minus the rank of this matrix the defining matrix of the linear system. Is that clear? Right. and solution space is exactly the definition of tangent space. So, you have that uh, rank of uh, T x p plus rank of this matrix has to be equal to the ambient <coughs> space dimension. Uh, fine next proposition will be about uh, Uh, the dual space. So, how is the dual space related to the germs? So, the tangent space somehow is approximating the variety and the functions on the tangent space which is the dual then should somehow be approximating the functions which are defined around p these are the germs right. So, what is the relationship can you guess. So, the dual which is uh, 
a 1 mod i x 1, how is it related to the germs. Uh, now what if you evaluate this function or any function uh, in this dual space at p the answer will be 0 right because you are only looking at linear forms. So at p you will get the answer 0. So this should somehow be related to mp because mp are the germs which vanish at p right. So is this correct the, the isomorphism? Yeah it cannot be because on the LHS you have linear forms in the RHS you have arbitrary potentially arbitrary polynomials. Yeah so you just do mp square so that is the geometric understanding of the dual space. So why is this true? Uh, by the way mp square is the ideal square right it basically you take uh, any two elements in mp multiply them and look at the ideal generated by these products so it's m, it's called m, mp square it's ideal square so when you do ideal square what you get is uh, the quadratics are considered zero Okay, you take a, I mean the a linear part of f in MP and a linear part of g in MP when you multiply them, they become quadratic. So this is somehow a linear object now. Okay, so how do you show this? consider the natural map phi which sends uh, let me just call it t dual to m mod m square everything is obviously with respect to p here in this context. So the, the natural map will be you take a, f a linear form in LHS and just view it as an element in MP right which is well we have to check whether it is actually defined. So it just sends f to f is it a well defined map so modulo MP square is it well defined. Uh, so f is in mp uh, right so since f is is already in mp you can also view it as as an element in mp mod mp square so it's clearly a well defined map uh, what i claim is that this map is actually an isomorphism No, no, the thing is that we have picked P to be the 0 point. So every linear form vanishes at 0. We are using that. Yeah, so it is a, it's a trivial thing once you have the correct point. Uh, so first thing we have to show is that it is injective. It is a ring homomorphism. Why is it injective? So phi is a in fact it is even a k vector space homomorphism we view it like that. Let us check injectivity uh, so say phi of s f is 0 which means what? which means this f which was in mp is actually in mp square which means what as f is a linear form v 
we get that f should actually be 0 in the polynomial ring. Is this clear? Right, mp square does not have any linear forms. So, if your f is in there, then it must be 0, which means that it is uh, 0 in your domain also. That is the tangent space dual, that is injectivity. Is that clear? So, next thing is surjectivity. So, let tau equal to f by g. So, what do you want to show? You want to show that uh, any element in mp over mp square, let us call it tau, that is a pre image f in uh, phi inverse of tau exists. So, we will actually construct that. So, let us pick an element in m p and without loss of generality, we can assume that g at p is 1, right, because uh, rational function tau around p defined around p, uh, g at p cannot vanish, it will be some constant. So, we can assume it to be 1. And I already want to give you the pre image tau prime. Can you catch that? What is the element in uh, the dual of the tangent space which phi will take to this tau? you have to just define a linear form right yeah so its coefficient should just be the derivatives of tau so we just we just use the derivatives call that tau prime that's our best case so to j tau at p times xj So, we will show that phi of tau prime is tau, okay, that is our goal. If you already see this, then we do not have to do the proof. Do you see this? So, basically tau mod m p square uh, <coughs> A tau prime, yeah, tau prime mod mp square. If you view that, it's the same as f by g. Okay, let's do this. So let us consider. Uh, I mean, we want to show essentially that tau prime and tau are the same, right? Modulo the modulo m square. So let, let's take the difference. So consider g times tau minus tau prime, because there is a denominator in the g. So, let us normalize by that and we are interested in tau minus tau prime. So, this is what? This is equal to f minus g times sigma of, uh, yeah, let us write that. at p times x j. Okay, and uh, we can continue this differentiation. So, you get f minus g times j uh, dou j f times g minus f times dou j g by g square at p times x j. Right, that is the Leibniz rule and what to do next? Well, this g square at p is just 1, so we can ignore that and uh, ah yeah, so the other thing I can ignore 
So, remember that g square at p is 1. Uh, so, you ignore g and g square. What can you do with f times dou j g evaluated at p? Well, it's zero. Yeah. Yeah. So we simplify all this, and we get, we get this. <coughs> Do J F uh, at P times X J. Is that clear? And uh, okay, I can continue this now mod m square. So, what I can do is uh, I can take the g inside. Why is that? Yeah, or you can simply think of this. So, g has in the constant part 1 and the remaining things are linear or higher degree. So, the constant 1 multiplied by with this while the linear and above part multiplied with this. So, that will multiply with x j and that will give a quadratic part. So, actually mod m p square. Uh, what you get is, yeah, I actually I can do it also directly. You get this. Is that clear? So, here we are using the fact that uh, g is equal to 1 plus uh, m. we are using this property. So, g is 1 plus uh, in fact even the ideal x bar. So, g has the constant term 1 and everything else is this monomials in x. So, uh, they will multiply with x g and then they will vanish mod m p square. <coughs> so, that is where we are at. Uh, right. What about f? Oh, f is still there. We have only eliminated g. Essentially, in this calculation, g becomes one. And the reason is this: we are going mod m p square. Uh, okay. What next? Yeah, how do I deduce that? No, no. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, yes, sure. Yeah, good. So, this is Right, so f was constant free, yeah, that also we are using. So, f was constant free, uh, and the other things were these uh, xj coefficients, but xj coefficients are equal to dho j f at p. So, we have gotten to 0, which basically means that tau and tau prime are the same. Is that clear? mod m p square. So, this is the magic of uh, of squaring the the germs which are vanishing at I mean the m, m p square m p ideal if you square it you get this uh, nice property. 
you have an isomorphism now, you have this subjectivity and hence isomorphism. So, phi of tau prime is indeed tau proving subjectivity. So, this means that phi is an isomorphism. Right, so yeah, so what we have learnt in these two propositions we can now summarize. K vector space, yeah, small k. Uh, so, what we have learnt is that uh, the dual of the tangent space, respectively, the tangent space itself uh, gives a first order approximation. of the germ set P. Respectively, the neighborhood of X. Okay, so, geometrically the tangent space is approximating the affine variety X around P and algebraically it is approximating the the germs which are defined around P and in fact giving you a first order approximation because we have reduced this question to linear algebra setting. That is how you can read these two propositions. Any questions? Okay. Uh, I can also write a corollary. So, the rank of the tangent space is equal to n minus the rank of the matrix which is uh, equal to n minus the rank of E 1 mod I x 1. which we have shown also equal to MP by MP square. Okay, so, all these things are the same. So, that is one property. The other property is that uh, rank of the tangent space is at least the dimension of X. Is this clear? Why is that? Because around the neighborhood of P, uh, we have potentially added more points than X had, right. So, dimension can only increase, it cannot decrease. Tangent can become a higher dimensional object. Since uh, TXP forgets higher order constraints. some of the higher order constraints that defined X. Yeah, so, I hope you can <coughs> see the formal proof from this. So, basically if the definition of T x p is forgetting about the quadratic and higher part of the constraints. So, the constraints become simpler potentially you may have more points around P. So, tangent space could have dimension bigger, but never smaller. Between X subset uh, 
I mean, our basic case for a curve, the tangent space is either a line or the, I mean, affine for fun space, the line or the plane, affine two space. So, sure, I mean, it is a subset. No, but tangent space is, uh, I mean, the only thing which is common between TXP and X is this point P. So, what you are claiming is too strong, can't do that. No, here it is only a statement, it is only a quantitative statement, it is not, we are not saying anything about the points. We are just saying that the dimension of X, if it was R, then uh, uh, the tangent space will have dimension at least R, it can also be R plus 1. No, no, you can also compare with the dimension, it is the same thing. Dimension of TXP and rank is equal, I think I mentioned that before. This here in orange, I mean as a variety the dimension is 1, but also as a vector space the rank is 1, it is the same thing. So, dimension of tangent space is at least dimension of the original variety you started with. Uh, so, what we want is, uh, we do not want the tangent space to go further away from x. So, we want these two things to be equal. So, if the dimension of tangent space is greater than dimension of x, then the tangent space has grown bigger, much bigger than the neighborhood of x at p, which implies that in this case, in that case, uh, tangent space has kind of lost all information. You do not want that to happen, okay, you do not want the tangent space to lose all local information. Uh, so, hence we will we'll be only interested in cases when the, when there is an equality. So, for that we define smoothness. So, x is called non-singular at p if rank of the tangent space is equal to dimension of x. Okay. And we can also call it that x is smooth at the point, p is a smooth point or p is a simple point. Okay, these terms are used interchangeably. It is a non-singular point, it is a smooth point or it is a simple point on the affine variety. And uh, x itself is called non-singular if there are no singularities. Okay, so if at every point studying the tangent space gives you good enough information locally then we call uh, the affine variety to be non-singular or smooth. 
Yes. The of x is L. Yeah, sure. Where? The rank of THP is proven to be n minus rank of the, the Cobian. Yeah, yeah, but the uh, yeah, Cobian may have uh, will have zero rank. It is always greater than equal to x to be the fine space only, or n is absolute absolute fine space, any subset of that is No, no. So, what is your example here? X is the fine n space. Okay. Dimension is n. Dimension is n. Yes. And like x is always a subset of the affine n space. So, dimension of x is always less than n. Dimension. No, no, no. No, give me the counter example for x and p such that this inequality is false. For the affine n space, you are right. So, if when dimension of x is n then what you are saying is the tangent space is also n, but it because it cannot be n plus 1. So, you can see that that happens. I mean in other words, if you have dimension n in affine n space, then that has to be a non-singular variety, which is correct. There is no, there is no conflict. Okay, now, let us take some examples that uh, you were asking before. So, let us take uh, so non affine space example, let us take this curve in the affine 2 space and let us take the point uh, we will take it to be 0. What can you say about the point in this affine variety? So, the best way is to use that uh, derivative matrix to compute the rank. So, let us look at that. So, rank of do j f here is you only have one polynomial. What is this? So, this is just a vector. So, it is equal to rank of uh, well minus 3 x 1 square and uh, 1 at the point p, which is rank of 0 1, which is 1, which implies that the rank of tangent space is equal to 2 minus 1, which is 1, which is dimension of x, which means that p is smooth. So, p is a non singular point on this uh, curve because you can check that the tangent space is not bigger, it is just exactly correct, matches the dimension. If you replace the h2 square now, then the rank will be higher. Good, so let us do that. So, let us do the same thing here x 2 square minus x 1 cube. Uh, so, notice that we had shown before that this is actually bi rational to the affine line, which may hint that this that every point should be smooth on this, but what we will show is that it is not the case. We will actually show that this point, this is a singular point, it is yeah it is not smooth, it is not simple. Let us do that calculation again. So, you get minus 3 x 1 square and now 2 x 2, but that will give you 0, which means that since this rank has reduced tangent space will increase. So, rank of the tangent space is now 2 minus 0, which is 2, which is greater than the dimension of x. 
it so tangent space has grown too big so which is piece of singularity but in the other point is the noise yes so you show that uh, this is the unique singularity this you have to show I, I i haven't shown this but you can show that this point p the zero point origin is the only singularity here uh, okay i can draw a picture for that then you will be convinced let's do that let's see a real life picture of what we just did so you have uh, x y and origin and what is happening here so uh, it's something like this the curve or maybe i should say x1 x2 actually and we are looking at uh, x2 square equal to x1 cube uh right so as x1 increases x2 also increases with this curvature and uh, it has to be symmetric along the across the x1 axis right so same thing below and at 1 it is 1 okay so so if you draw tangents anywhere things will be good like tangent here is this right you can see that anywhere you draw tangent it is a line except at the origin so this is the the only singularity uh well because i mean here you cannot even draw a tangent and when you do the calculation you see that actually the whole space is the tangent the tangent space so this and uh, otherwise it's the affine line is that clear so this is the unique singularity you can see this picture from the picture and prove it formally also any questions say so birationality cannot capture the essence of singularity yeah does it capture it uh, i think morphism should ca capture it i think uh, what happens is uh, yeah it's hard to say actually why did the birational uh, map violate singularity to just do the calculation and see what happens but it's there is no good explanation for that but we can record that so do uh, this x is birational equivalent to the affine line x is singular Yes, yeah, so I mean this is uh, there is something that is genuinely about X here. Uh, 
just having a bidirectional map to the line is isn't enough i mean so you can see in the picture this x looks very different from a line and that is a inherently two dimensional information and somehow that two dimensional information is completely contained at the origin so if i flip this uh, bottom part brought it above then it will become uh, uh, non non singular or smooth curve but here not so the thing is that we want to do that we want to remove the singularities okay at least for curves we in this course we want to uh, remove the singularity and get a birational non singular curve so that's the question we'll solve next can we make x birational equivalent to a non singular curve so this can be done and uh, we intend to show okay so topic will be resolving singularity and we'll restrict to curves only because this is hard or impossible on uh, non curves this will be a very uh, dimension 1 proof that we will see so to optimally exploit the tangent spaces we want to show that uh, every curve is birational to a non singular projective curve Okay, so this is uh, this is another twist that we will go from affine. We will be forced to go from affine to projective when we are resolving singularities. I mean, the idea is somehow, uh, yeah, you read, you can. We will show how to resolve a single, a unique singularity. If there are two points which are singular, then we will re resolve it in different ways. and then we'll have to glue the two ways together and that gluing naturally happens in the projective space okay projective space is by definition a glued object there were many affine patches and we have glued them together so that we get the projective variety so that that's what we'll have in the end but this will take some time so let's uh, see the resolution in this in this example the p equal to 0 singularity of x equal to z this curve how do we re, how do we resolve this unique singularity any ideas so so we will consider a um 
very different but related curve which is y square minus x 1. And uh, I claim that these two curves are bidirectional, which actually is the same proof as we gave for bidirectional equivalence with the affine line. It will be the same map. It is birational to x via association y uh, mapping to x2 by x1. Okay. So, I mean going straight away to v1, so we know that they are to what? The line, the fine line, we know that they are birational equivalent. Yeah, that is a good question why are we not doing that. Uh, so, the thing is that then what you are doing is you are just drawing a tangent at a point at the singularity and you are saying that now I will forget every other aspect of the curve and only look at this line. So, when there are very two when, uh, like uh, points of singularity in very different places, then which line will you pick? Right, you want to cover all aspects of the curve ultimately. Uh, so, you I mean it will be a very easy route to just take tangent space, but then the problem is that you will not be able to glue them. So, you want to stay as close as possible to the curve. The tangent space takes you actually very far away in that in that respect. How will it characterize that this is a good resolution and that is a bad resolution? No, no. So, no, no, you want this uh, theorem to be proved. Every curve is bi-rational to a non-singular projective curve. If you just took tangent spaces at different points of singularity, then you will not get the projective curve. Then you will be moving to something else. Yeah. For example, then with just two points of singularity, you will get the affine and two space which is not a curve actually, you move you have increased the dimension. So, you do not want to do that, you do not want to go to non curve, you want to stay in curve which is why this is a highly non trivial result, it actually on the face of it, it looks unbelievable. That from a curve you can modify it to a different curve such that the fields will be isomorphic for function fields and every point will be smooth. So, that is what this trick will achieve. Uh, what this is doing is uh, around, of course, around the origin in that neighborhood, it is uh, kind of abstracting out this undefined quantity 0 by 0. So, x 2 by x 1 is, uh, is not a germ, right. This is not a germ at 0. this is not defined in O x p. So, it is taking this undefined function, rational function on x and uh, uh, it is calling it y and then you look at y square minus x 1, still you have a bi rational uh, equivalence and you can see that x tilde is smooth everywhere. No. Uh, you can check that. No, no, this case calculation we already did. That was the x2 minus x1 cube. You do that for x2 minus x1 square. No, no, but that is a mistake. If you go by the definition, uh, 0 is a smooth point. The calculation we did right, I mean which is why drawing pictures may be wrong because. Uh, 
really? So we are seeing uh, y, y is square root of x1. So in the real space, x1 look at this what do you think now every point has a tangent space dimension 1 so curvature has changed so yeah let us write it there now So, x tilde is non singular and birational, is a non singular curve and birational to x. Okay, that is the example. Uh, we will now do this uh, in general. Okay, we will do it in a way which is abstract enough to be able to glue without drawing pictures because drawing pictures will be impossible when you do it for two different points uh, you have to you can imagine the problems right the curvature has to be changed in a way so that in both the points good things happen and overall it's a curve and also bad things shouldn't happen in a third point so, you cannot control this by drawing pictures. So, we have to do this systematically and uh, yeah, that is what we will start next time. That is where your uh, we, we our algebra will become more complicated. So, we will achieve this next time by introducing uh, discrete valuation rings. So, we will develop DVRs to achieve this for multiple singularities. Okay, so, discrete valuation rings we will study next time.